Okay, well thanks for coming. Um, my name's Neville Starrick. I run a business called Signature Support Services, which is not an IT business at all. Um, I'm here actually to talk about other issues around systems that you're involved in that are not technology related. So I will apologise in advance because I am a user of IT, but I don't particularly get, I get technology to work for me particularly well. So hopefully everything will run to plan, and if it doesn't, we'll win. So, um, if you haven't noticed, there are chairs that have got, got um, little flyers on them. We're going to be needing those flyers a little bit later, so if you could make sure that you had one, that would be useful because I will be explaining what's going on with those very, very shortly. Okay, um, today I just wanted to, go to make sure that you went away with three things around the topic of stress, and I'm talking about a system check. So I want you to keep that in mind. We're putting stress into context, and I want you to go away with, if I can get my computer to work, technology num glitch number one. There you go. Okay, just the aims of what I'm planning to do today is to give you some information about stress. Some of this stuff you'll probably already know, um, and if you don't, um, great. If you do, what I'm hoping to do is to kind of connect some dots for you so that it's very clear how all the pieces fit together, because sometimes there's a bit of misinformation out there about stress and um, some funny ideas about what, what it involves and what it doesn't involve. I want to give you a tool that you can use to help monitor how you're doing. Um, monitor your, your state of mind, monitor your energy levels, and we'll come to that in a second. And I want to give you a strategy that can help you if the stress gets a bit overwhelming, to begin to de-escalate the stress experience. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm hoping to go for today, and I'm hoping that that works for you. Um, as you will have noticed, there is a grid that's sitting there on the flyer in, on your seat or close to your seat. Does anybody not have one? I've got spares. Aha! The people who went straight to the back. So, okay. So you've got one? Yep. Okay. You can pass those back. There's a few extras. Okay. Or you could move down. Yes. That would be a novel idea. <laughs> so, this. This grid is just a way to answer the question, how are you? Our functioning as human beings relies on a couple of different factors, and I'm focusing in particularly on our physical energy, the energy that allows us to get things done, and also our perspective as well. So, the physical energy, there's a continuum of going along that horizontal axis. Physical energy at one end is you're asleep, you've got no energy, you're basically out to it. At the other end, you are so buzzing with energy that you can't sit still. Now, I could just about tell that there would be people who would be falling asleep by this stage, but you've done pretty well. So most people shouldn't be at the, at the extreme end of that. Um, the people who might be at the extreme of the other, of the very high energy, are probably sitting there with a leg jiggling or trying to fiddling with something just to keep themselves from not jumping out of the chair. So um, that's kind of what the physical energy axis is about. The other axis is the perspective <coughs> axis. I'm calling it perspective, but it's covering a whole range of things about your internal functioning. It has an energy of its own as well that's quite separate from your physical energy. And it includes a whole range of emotional and feeling type of things, some of which we don't like to acknowledge. So moving up the scale, the feelings and emotions and the perspectives that you have might be very, very positive. You might be experiencing things like contentment and joy and happiness and just feeling generally calm and well. As you're moving down to the negative end of that vertical, ax vertical axis, the feelings become a little bit more uncomfortable. There might be anxiety in there, there might be feeling a bit sad, might be feeling a bit down, depressed, that kind of thing. So, um, while I'm using the terms positive and negative for the both ends of the scale, I just want to let you know that all of those emotions are valid. There's, no, there's nothing that you shouldn't be experiencing at any time. Um, the, the, the emotions in that perspective area are giving you signals about where you find yourself. So when we put the two, the two things together, the physical energy and the perspective, 
you end up with a whole range, you end up marking yourself, plotting yourself on the grid. If you're in that top left-hand quadrant, you'd have low physical energy and your perspective is pretty, pretty good. You're feeling pretty happy. You might feel this after lunch. You've had a good meal. You're feeling pretty, pretty happy. Um, content, don't, don't have to be doing anything, but um, feeling pretty good nonetheless. In this quadrant here, you've got high energy and a high mood, a high perspective. This is, the, this is a, uh, a place where you are able to get a lot of things done. Here, if I was in this position, maybe I might be feeling a bit anxious. I've got something that's looming. I've got a lot of energy to get things done, but I know that things can go wrong. So I'm sort of not feeling in the best space, but I've got a lot of energy to be able to do something about it. Here, I've lost my energy and I don't feel real great. This could be an indicator that I'm getting sick. It could be an indicator that I've overextended myself. It could be a, a whole range of things that are going on here. Okay, just take a minute on your grid to plot where you are just at this moment. Where is your energy and where is your perspective? For me, I'm sitting here with a fair amount of energy. I, I'm towards the high end of the scale for energy and I'm bouncing between a positive perspective because I know my stuff and I feel like I've got a lot that I could say and I'm really quite happy to be here but I'm also aware that I've got time constraints and I'm sort of wondering if I'm going to be able to fit everything in. So I've got eight pages worth of notes and 80 slides and it's just like how is that all going to work? So there's a bit of, a, a bit of an anxiety there that's sitting around where I'm at. So I'm bouncing between those two quadrants. Is anybody sitting in the top left hand quadrant, the low energy and the high mood, high perspective? Okay, cool. Is anybody sitting with high energy and high, high perspective? Okay, okay, you guys, if you need to, go for a run around the room. Okay. Um, is anybody sitting there with high energy but the mood, the, the perspective is a little bit lower, sort of feeling a little bit somewhat negative? Okay, people don't have to admit that, that's fine. And the physical energy and the, is low and the perspective is low. Is anybody feeling in that space? Okay, hopefully by the end of this you might be a little bit more energised. I can't guarantee that, but um, we'll see what we can do to help make a difference if we can. Okay, where you find yourself on the grid gives you some information about uh, what you can expect of yourself. It gives you also some information about um, how you are and uh, what your system may need to be able to function and do everything that's necessary. Okay, if you're in that top, skip that, if you're in that top quadrant, it's a great space if you're needing to be creative. You don't have to get anything done, but you can brainstorm ideas. You've got lots of, uh, you haven't got a lot of energy to do anything, but you've got lots of space and the right headspace to be able to come up with possibilities. So that can be a really good space to be in. Okay, over in this space, if your perspective is high and your energy is high, this is your productivity space. You've moved beyond just brainstorming ideas, you've found something you want to do, and you've got the energy to get it done. So this can be very useful. The third quadrant here is the troubleshooting phase. I can see that something could be going wrong and, and my, my, the emotions that I'm feeling are letting me know that I need to do something about it before things go completely pear-shaped. So troubleshooting phase, those feelings are actually giving me some information about, hey, I've got to make some changes. And the energy is there to be able to do them. This final quadrant is a rest and recovery phase. I'm feeling flat, I'm feeling like I don't have any energy because I've used it up and I really need to take care of that. If I ignore that for too long, I could, my perspective could slide down even further. Okay, is that making sense so far? Okay, periodically throughout this presentation, I'm just going to get you to just check to see if anything's changed. Oh, one thing that I forgot to do earlier is like this morning, when you, when you got up this morning, where would you plot yourself on that grid? Just take a, take a couple of seconds to just have a look there. Did anyone notice that they were not there in a different place this morning than they are now? 
Okay, that's normal. That's normal and I want to let you know that you're not designed, your, your human system is not designed to sit there and have you sit in one quadrant for the entire day. So there will be shifts, there will be movement and that is okay. Okay, moving right along. So all of, these, all of these quadrants are important. It's important to be moving through it. Your system is dynamic. Now I've been using this term system to talk about us as people. Now, system, you guys, a lot of you guys work with systems. I don't understand how your systems work, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this system works. Okay, so the human system, I, I'm using ideas borrowed from the field of cybernetics. Cybernetics is the study of how systems work and what makes them effective. Um, one of the things that makes a system effective is that there's a pattern of integrated response for optimal performance. So your system is designed for working well at all times. Now that may mean different things at different stages of the day and different stages of your life. Um, so the question that we need to explore is like, how do you get optimal performance and what's going to assist that? Um, before I get into that, I just want to explore the whole thing. The, the system that we've got is made up, of, made up of integrated components. They work together, they're in symbiotic relationship. What happens to one happens to the other. We've got our physical structure, our bones, our muscles, all our bodily organs, they're all there. And also our bio, biochemical and neurological processes. Science has actually given us a lot of information about what those are and how they work. Um, so there's some pretty clear evidence about those areas. The, the side that's probably less clear is the things around our intellectual functioning and the emotional signals. These also come into play in our system and they're a bit harder to pin. All of these components work together, they influence each other and they are influenced by all the rest and they're responsive to the influences that come from outside of the system as well. So we've got a, a, a pattern of integrated response for optimal performance. At peak performance, all of these things are working together. They're not being ignored, they're not being, not one being favoured over the other. Um, so things like the, your, your sleep patterns and so on continue, uh, the amount of food that you put into your system, all that stuff has an influence on making sure that this works at its optimal performance. Okay, so there's a regular pattern of functioning that goes on that includes all of those components of the system. And these, this pattern of functioning affects produce the production of energy and also the expenditure of energy. So you've got to have energy to be able to expend it, but then once you've expended it, you need to be able to find more to be able to continue to function. The system also needs to have opportunity to maintain itself and to repair itself. So if those things are not happening, the system will eventually fall down and stop functioning at optimal performance. So all of that, I, I'm just laying the groundwork here because all of that has an influence on um, how we deal with stress. Now, ideally, our system operates on this sine wave type of pattern. It's like sine wave, Looking at our energy levels, at the top we've got high energy, at the bottom we've got low energy. These are called circadian rhythms, some of you may have heard of them. They are affected particularly by sleep patterns, by the amount of sunlight you get, by the food that you eat and the way your metabolism works to process that food and turn it into energy. So um, in an ideal world these functions would all be balanced and um, the circadian rhythms would be very, very regular. Now, in an, in an ideal world, of course, that's, that's fine, but we don't live in an ideal world. So, just putting those two things together, the, the chart that we've got is with, with the circadian rhythm pattern. These two things kind of work together. Um, the chart that I have left on your seat is actually um, taking an extra dimension to this first one here, the, the horizontal the horizontal axis correlates pretty well to the energy levels over time. And then we've got that extra dimension of your, your internal perspective, which almost makes it a three-dimensional function here. Okay, so coming back to the effective human system, there's a pattern of integrated response for optimal performance, and 
there's a, the system is also self-regulating. So trying to keep that regular pattern going over and over and over again, making sure that um, the optimal performance continues as much as is possible. This is really important as we start dealing with, start talking about this, this topic of stress. Okay, so what is stress? Any ideas? Thoughts, perspectives? No? Okay, we throw it around a lot. But I, I'm going to give you a really simple definition. So we've talked a lot about the system and how the system has a regular pattern. Stress is the experience of operating outside of one's regular pattern of functioning. So once that rhythm gets interrupted, uh, stress happens. That stress can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, but basically you're not functioning as, you, as your system is designed to function. So that could wreak havoc. We tend to see stress in this manner. Like stress, we're getting squashed, we're getting crushed. It's, it's often seen in very negative terms. However, stress can also be very positive. It can, it can improve your performance. It can uh, enable you to do things that you might not ordinarily be able to do. So when, it, when we use the term stress, it, it's got a positive and a negative connotation. So you've got to be really, really careful about how you're using it. I would like to use the term distress for when the stress gets to a point where it's overwhelming. Okay, so which is the stress that we tend to think about when we, we use that term. So I'm going to use the word distress um, to talk about the really negative experience of stress that's not helpful. Okay. So the human system is designed to function in a stable, regular pattern. And it's got several responses when that pattern gets interrupted. The interrupted pattern could look something like this. It's got a red line there where the, this, the energy spikes and you're going crazy. Or there could be a, a stress response where the energy drops and you have absolutely no, no energy to accomplish the things that you need to do. So let's um, take a quick look at, at those responses here. When, when the system gets out of regular functioning, it sets off an alarm, an internal alarm within you, within you to say that something's wrong, we're out of regular functioning, we need to get back into regular functioning as much as possible. Once that alarm goes off, well, it doesn't really matter where, what has set the alarm off. Once the alarm has gone off, the, the system, your human system, has several responses that it could take. Okay? You can have a hyperactive response where the energy is really high, or it could have a hypoactive response where the energy has dropped and you just don't have anything to give. Okay? Let's just explore that for a minute. The hyperactive response, one of the responses is that I'm going to fight. I've got energy, I'm going to attack this problem, I'm going to remove the source of this stress because I think I'm bigger than it. Okay, so I'll come out fighting, I will do what I can, I'll be proactive, I will really attack whatever it is that is considered to be a threat by the system. So that's one hyperactive response. If the, if the threat to the system ends up being a bit bigger than you are, as your second response will turn up, you might do a flight. I'm going to run away. This is too big for me. I'm going to get eaten. So I'm going to disappear. So I've got lots of energy. I can still do something, but my response is to get away from the thing that's causing the stress. A valid response. Sometimes that's really, really important to do. Okay, a third response that's probably lesser known is the freeze response. I've got energy. But I can't work out if the danger or the threat that I'm facing is something that I should stay and fight or I should run away from and I'm kind of stuck. You know about the deer in headlights look where I'm just like, I, I see these lights but I don't know what, how I'm supposed to respond to them. Okay, so that's, those are the three typical hyperactive responses. Um, fight, flight or freeze. Now, there's really only, uh, uh, let's just go with some of the symptoms, physical symptoms. Your adrenaline is pumping, so you've got increased energy, your muscles get really tight, your, your heart rate increases, the blood flow tends to go towards the muscles and moving away from your inter internal organs, uh, your blood pressure goes up, your breathing gets faster and shallower, um, you're quicker in responding to things when you're in this state. And the, you've got non-essential functions decide that they're going to shut down for the time being. 
So this is not the time where you're going to be having a romantic stroll with your partner. This is, you are not in that space at all. Um, and often things like your digestion will be affected as well. You may find that when the stress, when the hyperactive response kicks in, you will want to go to the toilet. So that's pretty, pretty typical. Okay, mental, mentally, you become very focused. Your focus becomes very sharp and it becomes almost a matter of life and death. If it's not life or death, I'm not even thinking about it. So there's increased vigilance. You're, you're very aware of your surrounding when the stress is up, stresses are high. You're very quick at, at prioritizing what needs to be done. And you tend to be responding instinctively or intuitively rather than going through a process of intellectually deciding this is a good course of action. This, the stress is basically saying you don't have time to mull over your decisions. You've got to make a decision just like that. Okay? Emotionally, you're probably going to experience symptoms of nervous, nervousness and anxiety, and that's normal at this level of stress. Okay? And that anxiety is helping you to generate the energy that will allow you to respond to the threat that your system has identified. Okay? The, the alternate response is the hypoactive response, and there's really only one response here, is that you're just playing dead. The danger, the, the, the threat that you're facing is too big to fight, you're not fast enough to get away from it, and there's just, it's better to just kind of go into a comatose state than to sit there and try and do anything directly with that threat that your system is, has identified. So playing possum is a response, and some of the symptoms of that your loss of energy, your muscles go pretty slack, your, your breathing changes, it becomes very shallow and very slow. Your heart rate slows down, you might, you might experience a decrease in body temperature. Okay, that's the physical side. The mental side is that everything slows down inside. If you're playing dead, if you're trying to convince a potential danger that you are no threat to it and for it to leave you alone, um, you're not thinking about anything, you just floppy and that becomes like a mental state as well so blanking out reduced memory functions might happen there might be an inability to absorb information and on an emotional level you might experience numbness or a sense of shock and there may be symptoms of, of depressive state so very low feeling feeling very flat okay so basically you, you're having a retreat on a physical mental and emotional level so if, if I pretend that I'm not here, then maybe whatever the threat is will not have any effect on me. Okay, so I, just a quick example of that from my own experience. I was involved in a car accident about hmm, 2005. Um, I was heading back from having lunch with some co-workers. We were driving in my car and basically what happened is that another vehicle came out from the side from behind a parked bus and didn't see us um, and came zooming across and I had slowed down just enough and didn't know why I'd slowed down but just had this weird sense that something was going on with the bus and the other vehicle came and clipped the front of my car. Well, my co-workers were sitting there on the passenger side and they would have been killed had we been moving just that little bit closer. Their response was freak out. I mean, they were yelling, they were screaming, they wanted to get out and throttle the guy in the other vehicle. Um, their energy was incredibly high and they were talking a blue streak. You, you, the air was blue. So, um, me, on the other hand, I was the driver of the vehicle and while I didn't get, go quite to the play dead stage, I went very quiet because suddenly I got hit with the, the overwhelm that oh, I could have been involved in a fatal accident and everything just kind of shut down because that was just too big too big of an experience to absorb. So I went really quiet. I was still functioning and could still, was still aware of what was going on, but people were actually a bit concerned because I really wasn't responding much at all. Okay, later on, I got the, all the responses, but at the time, the stress, my stress response was to just basically shut down and just do the bare minimum of functioning. Okay, so th those, are, those are the extremes. Now, Stress responses will vary from person to person and from situation to situation, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the spread of things that are possible. Okay, so you're probably wondering what all the balloons are doing here, and I just wanted you to um, 
just go and grab one for a minute and I'm going to do an experiment with you. So you just want to go and grab a balloon, that'll be great. Okay. Thank you. That was it. How many people jumped? How many people were startled? Okay. So some of you experienced a stress response. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry for those people who don't like having balloons being popped, but um, that was just giving you a little bit of a taste of what can happen. Now I'm noticing that some of you didn't startle a whole lot, but you're sitting there laughing now. And I don't know, some of you might be feeling a little bit of trembling because this was unexpected. And some of you may wish to actually talk to somebody about what just happened. Those are all really good responses to dealing with, a stre with dealing with stress and they're kind of your first level responses that your, your system will do, is they will, they will get you to get rid of that excess energy if you've gone into a hyperactive mode or they will start to help you to generate some energy to cope with the unexpected thing that's just happened. Okay, so yeah, the human system is designed to function on a regular, in a regular pattern. Okay? Okay. Do you want to just take a quick little check now and see if you've moved at all on that grid? Um, are you still in the same place you were when you checked it right at the beginning of this session? Has anybody shifted? <laughs> okay. So just moving to this idea of the human system. There's integrated components. Okay. Integrated components and um, it's a self-regulating system. It wants to stay in a stable pattern. Okay. And when there are interruptions, it works hard to try and get back into that regular pattern as quickly as possible. Some of you, after that little interruption that we had there with the balloon popping, you're already back into regular functioning. Your system was really quick in adjusting. Others may take a little bit longer depending upon what you have experienced, and that's fine. Uh, your system is working its way back into regular functioning, okay? If anybody, just by the way, if anybody is still struggling at the end of this, this talk with that, come and talk to me because there may be some other things going on that you might need to sort out. Okay, so where does stress come from? Some pretty obvious things. I mean, physical environment is one, the weather the traffic out there, um, the food that you ate, uh, the food that you're going to eat, the food that you haven't had, all of that, um, natural disasters, all that kind of thing, they have an influence on the system. The social environment also has an impact. I mean, we have to, have to relate to people and the interactions can raise our stress levels or drop them. So sources of stress can be from that angle. Um, but they can also come from within. A lot of the stress that we experience is actually based on things that are not real, in the sense that they're not actually happening right now. Our minds have this wonderful capacity to be able to, to imagine what could be going on or what might come about, come about this, and that can generate stress on its own. So even though the event that you're imagining isn't actually happening right now, your body doesn't distinguish between the internal stuff and the stuff that's right in front of you. It will still produce a stress response. So that sort of raises some very interesting questions there about how do you manage that? Because the imagination, you, have, you do have some control over that. Okay, the system is designed, designed to eventually return to regular functioning. How effectively you return to regular functioning after a stress response has been activated is an indication of how resilient you are. If your resilience is low, it will take a long time. If your resilience is high, you will probably bounce back pretty quickly. Keep in mind though, it depends upon the severity of the stress. The stress for one, and stress, the severity varies from person to person. What one person sees as just a minor thing may be a major catastrophe for somebody else. So it's really, really difficult to compare stress responses. Okay, we've talked a lot about the influences on the system and the system working its way through trying to um, self-regulate and so on. And it, I guess that raises a really interesting question. Are you controlled by your system? Can you do anything about it? 
Is it just going to do what it does without your, without your influence or can you do something about your responses to stress? And the answer, are you in the matrix? <laughs> the answer is yes and no. You have some influence over the system. You don't have total influence over the system, but you have some. You can choose the red or the blue pill. Ah, yes. You can choose the red or the blue pill or whatever other color pill that happens to be there. Um, but you, you do have some choices that you can make that can reduce or eliminate some of the, stress the stresses that you find in your life and your response to them. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Okay, coming back to our, our grid here, we talked about the positive aspects of each of these, each of these quadrants. So if your, your energy and all of, these, all of these quadrants have something that can be really helpful for you in your functioning. The problem becomes when you get stuck in one area and that's when it starts bringing out the darker side of each of these, quadr each of these quadrants. Over here, if your physical energy is constantly low and your perspective is constantly high, there's a, there's a good chance that you start detaching from reality. It's like, and it can also be a good way that you start moving into addiction if that's where you constantly want to be. So the self-medication, the recreational drugs may actually lead you into this space a lot, but there are some really, really bad side effects. So um, over here, if you're constantly high energy and high perspective, over time, if that doesn't change, it burns out your system. You, you're not designed to have an unlimited amount of energy. So, I mean, if you're constantly in that space and never getting any time to recharge, that's going to have some negative impacts on your system and you will not be able to do optimal performance. If your energy remains high and your perspective is constantly low, you, you may find yourself dealing with varying levels of anxiety and the anxiety may become unmanageable if you're constantly there. Mm -hmm. And over here, if your energy and your perspectives are, are low, that could end up leading you into a depressive state. You're just living with depression. Okay? So, what can we do about it? I just want to, want to note that our culture has an influence here. Um, our culture seems to value very much the high energy, high, uh, high perspective mode. We're, we're kind of told in a lot of different ways that hey, we need to be productive, we need to be upbeat, we need to be functioning well and be, to be seen to be doing that. And that's actually unhealthy if we live like that constantly. We need, we need the other things to balance ourselves out and to keep our system regulated. Okay, so how do you influence the system? If you're going to change the system, if you're going to um, deal with things that are changing your system, if you can, make the changes small and spread it out over a long period of time. If you're going, if you're going to change, say, your sleep patterns, don't suddenly switch into, into going to bed at a different time. Do it little bit by little bit and move into it if you can. Okay, or if the, if the changes have to be high intensity and they, they, they just happen, and some of them are, um, make, make sure there's a limit on it. Make sure that it's not going to go on indefinitely so that your system knows I've got to sustain myself for this amount of time and then I'll have a break and be able to recover. So your system is not designed to be constantly in stress mode. That is an, an aberration of the regular functioning. It should not be regular functioning. Okay. So whatever the case, Monitor your energy and your perspective. That will give you some pretty good clues as to where you're at and what you need. If my energy is high and my perspective is high, let me go, let's use this time to go and get something done. If my energy is low and my perspective is low, hey, I need to take stock of that and pay attention. Have I, have I overdone it in some area? Do I need to give myself a rest space? Where can I fit that in? You start asking some different kinds of questions there. It's like instead of pushing through it, you actually make some space to work with your system because then your system will continue to sustain you for optimal performance in the long term. Okay, so use, use this tool if that's helpful for you. It's just one way of monitoring where you're at, but you might have others that work for you. Uh, it's just one, one thing that you can use as a tool. 
Okay, evaluate the activities according to your values. There are so many things that go on around us that tell us that everything is important. And you're finite. You can't possibly do everything. So you're going to have to decide what is important and shelve the things that are not. So the things that are important to you, make sure that those get priority and that other competing priorities find their place. Recognize your limits. You're not Superman or Superwoman. Um, you will eventually run out of energy at some point. So pay attention to your energy levels and do something about that so that you don't run out completely. Your, your, your system keeps a reserve for the stress response, but if that reserve runs out, it's got nothing, nothing left to fall on. So don't allow that reserve to run out. Build in regular, regular breaks to recharge. Now, People might think that that's a, that's a holiday, a vacation, going away for a while. That's one thing, but that's only sporadic. I'd probably go down to a daily level. Where are my breaks in my day? So that I can actually recharge, that I can actually go and um, regain a bit of energy or give myself a little bit of rest. Give yourself permission to do nothing at least once during the day. Probably more often than that if you can manage it, but at least once in a day, give yourself the opportunity to just stop because your system needs it. Your system needs it to be able to, to recharge and to continue functioning. Seek personal and professional support as needed. Don't underestimate the value of being connected to other people. That's going to be really important for, for you to manage um, stress well. Um, sometimes your friends don't help you in these particular things. They give you trite answers. And if that's the case, seek some professional help. Um, someone who's not invested in seeing you get fixed, but who can actually help walk you through the journey to, to wellness. Okay, I'm right on time. And I'm not gonna be able to do this. Um, so, actually, how am I going? Do I have time? Okay. This is just a very, very easy strategy that you can do if you're finding yourself in the midst of distress. I'm not going to guarantee that it's going to get rid of the stress, but it can start the process of you being able to manage it well. Some of you probably already know this, um, and some of you are probably going to be a bit sceptical about whether or not it's going to work or not, but could you just bear with me and we'll just do this process, and then I'll explain to you what it's supposed to be doing and why it, why it should work. Okay, so basically what you're doing here is just a series of really long, deep, slow breaths. Okay, so just get you sitting up nice and straight, feet flat on the floor, and just back pretty straight because you're going to get, you're trying to get really deep breaths, and if you're slumped over, your, your lungs are not going to be able to be filled to capacity. Okay, now the way I tend to do this is I just count four really slowly. So I have four, four counts breathing in, four counts just holding that breath in, and then four counts breathing that breath out. Okay? And, uh, and just doing it nice and slowly, keeping a nice, even rhythm. And um, you can close your eyes with this if you want. If, if it helps, you can just put a hand on the, on, the st on the diaphragm here. The diaphragm should be pushing out as you take your breath in. That, that tells you that you're doing a really good deep breath. Okay, um, and if it helps to get the breath down there, you can purse your lips about, as if you're about to whistle. So, I'm sort of breathing in. So, we ready? Okay, I'm going to count to four, and we're breathing in on four now. One, two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Exhale. Two, three. Four. We're going to do that two more times. Try again. In, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Let go, two, three, four. In, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Release two, three, four. Okay, that was just three cycles. Has anybody noticed that anything changed? Okay, what, what did you notice? Uh, a sort of calmness. Okay, a bit of calmness. Did anybody else notice something became a little bit calmer in there? Okay, 
<laughs> yes, dizziness does happen. Dizziness does happen because if you have not been doing deep breathing, your body has not been getting much oxygen and you're suddenly getting a whole bunch more and it gives you a head spin. So I do not recommend doing this while you're driving. Okay? Um, so what's actually, what's actually happening here is that, remember how the stress response goes in, increases or it changes your breathing rhythm? Okay, when you're hyperactive, you're breathing really fast. <laughs> hyperactive type of hyperventilating type of stuff. Your body's not getting a lot of it, lot of oxygen at all, and that kind of feeds the stress response. The body's going, I haven't got much oxygen. I need to continue to stay in this heightened state or in this really low state. Okay, coming back to doing the slow deep breathing actually tells your body you can't be in danger because you're able to get this much breath in. So your body actually says, oh, I've got a lot more oxygen. That must mean the danger is either less than it was or it's gone away. So maybe I can relax some other things. So maybe the muscle tension might change. Maybe you might find that um, your, your blood pressure starts to drop a little, your heart rate may slow down. All of those kind of things are really helpful for de-escalating that stress response. Okay, um, it, as I said, if the stress is really, 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 really severe, that's only going to be the beginning of a process. It's not going to fix the stress because if the stress is still actually present, your body is still going to be in stress response mode. But it may actually give you that just that moment to feel like the distress is not overwhelming anymore and to be able to then work through that stress response and see it to its completion so that you then move back into regular functioning. Okay? So I just wanted to leave you with, with that. Um, Okay, so basically the, the, the changing in the breathing and your deliberately, deliberate engagement in slowing your breathing down is helping your body to recognize it can go back into re the regular pattern again. That's your influence that can come into play. Okay, so you're, you're actually using your physical structure to then influence the rest of your structure. As the breathing settles, the anxiety might come down and the, the, the um, thoughts may slow down as well. Okay, so my aims were to give you a little bit of information, a tool, and a strategy. How do you think I've done? <laughs> okay, so just note where you are right now on your chart. Have you moved again? Or are you still in the same spot that you were before? Thank you. Yes, question. I have a question. Uh, we are a product of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution mm -hmm. and, and we may be evolving from, mm. from animals yes. where certain things had a function. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were deer and suddenly, suddenly a tiger comes out of the bush, we have to yep. run. Yes, and yes. We start to discuss. Uh, yes, with absolutely. Mm -hmm. So some of the these quadrants have a certain yeah have been imprinted in yes okay. and even though even though in our evolution we don't seem to face those kind of dangers to the same degree the dangers are still present and the system still recognizes that hey i've got to respond here yeah. something is happening to me that is potentially detrimental to me as a system so that kind of it, it still kicks in maybe for different reasons now. And the second thing is that we have a memory of the past. Yes. But there is also something like a memory of the future. Okay. Continuously our subconscious is thinking about mm -hmm. the next half hour. Yes. What's going to happen yep. and then we have to go there and there. Yep. And then if that suddenly is not is, is interrupted, then, then we get this in, hey, is unexpected. Yes. We, we thought we expected everything already. Yep. Which is not true. Mm -hmm. People don't like to be. No. <laughs> so change is hard, particularly change that you didn't choose. So. Yeah. Yeah. What? When was that? What's that? I mean, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, don't get onto it. There'll be some disappointed people. Okay, um, I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference. Um, if people want to just touch base about anything they want more clarification on, um, and Arian's going to give a little bit more information too about what other functions. I can. Thank you, Neville.